feel like, you know, if I've got something that's inside of me, I'm all about feeling it and going through the depth of sometimes some of the rawest emotions to be able to move through them. Um, But it's an interesting one when we talk about not just ourselves, but our kids, because it is obviously human nature for if we see our child is upset to want them to not feel upset. And the way we do that is to, like you said, change the subject, say it's going to be okay, Mm -hmm. not allow them to actually feel what they're feeling. And as we all know, the research is now showing that that is what we need our kids to do. But I wonder for someone who's in a situation where they haven't been doing that, what is the language around how we should be talking to our child? Mm, I think parents often will come to me and say, oh, God, I've, you know, I feel like I'm messed, I've messed it up. I've been shutting my kids down. I've been distracting them or, you know, I feel really uncomfortable with feelings. So, you know, have I, have I damaged them? And I'll often say it is never too late to heal, ever, ever. Mm. And every day we have the opportunity to tune into someone and to get calm within ourselves and just listen and be present. And so I think that when um, a lot of kids develop uh, a story that says, hey, it's not okay to feel, and and that's just because of the family of origin they've grown up in. I mean, that applies to most of us as adults. We grew up in a behaviorism paradigm that when we were young and when we got angry, we got upset. We either got sent to our room, we got shut down, we might've got smacked. Many of us as adults learned pretty early on, don't feel. So what do we, what do we learn to do? We learn to repress our feelings or we hold on to them and then it comes out in aggression. And so I we see the same thing with our kids. Our kids learn to repress their feelings. So that's why often they want the iPad when they're upset or they want to eat more food or they can't sit still. They have to move their bodies all the time. You know, there's these beautiful classic control things that kids do to not feel. And so what we, I think, need to do as adults is firstly just observe and watch. When my child is upset, do they kind of, you know, disassociate and suckle those feelings in? Are they looking to distract themselves so they don't have to feel? And what we need or or the antidote to repression is connection. Mm. So when somebody is upset, it's about coming in gently and and creating that safe space to say, hey, I'm here and I'm listening. Now with our kids, if they've learned really early on to not feel, sometimes that takes a lot of practice and sometimes that takes lots of invitations to say, hey, you can let it out and I'm listening and I'm not going to judge you. Uh, Sometimes the best way through is through play and laughter Mm. to connect and create that beautiful connection between the parent and the child. So the child kind of, their whole nervous system relaxes a little bit because laughter is such a beautiful stress release as well. And then the feelings can start to come up. You know, when I worked with teenagers, one of the biggest take-homes I learned from them is um, is about listening. So I would say to all of them, every teen I worked with, I'd ask the question, if you could change one thing about your parent or if there's one thing you wish your parents would know, what w- what would you want that to be? And 85% of them would say, I just want them to listen. But there were three things they wanted. They firstly wanted them to listen without judgment so that when those teens were coming to you saying, you know, such and such is vaping in the toilet or this person did this, that you know, as a parent, we didn't get into the drama around that. And we didn't get into the, you know, well, they're, you know, they're, they're not a very good person, are they? Well, they're not a great student. You know, they don't want the judgment, right? So the first thing they wanted is, is to not be judged by what they were sharing. The second thing, and this is so pivotal, is to not be fixed, is to be able to say, hey, this is what's going on for me. And this feels really hard. And for a parent to be able to sit there and go, yeah, that sounds hard. Tell me more. Because what we do as parents, as we just touched on, is we We move so quickly to fixing because it's so uncomfortable for us to see our child struggle. I mean, and who hasn't as an adult um, gone through those experiences when we were teens where we didn't get picked in the basketball team or a friend said they didn't want to be friends with us anymore or a, you know, boyfriend kissed our best friend or, you know, we've all had experiences like that. We know how painful it was. Mm. And then when you've got a teen in front of you going through the same thing, well, every single part of you wants to stop that. You don't want them to feel that pain and that anger. Yet 
those challenges are so vital for children's growth and development. Mm. And the difference between that being something that can create resilience and not is whether a teenager has somebody to lean into who will listen to them, where they get to offload their feelings in a healthy way, and then they are able to open up the possibility of seeing what that was about, that growth and learning and move on. So when teens go through those, you know, challenging experiences which they're going to what they deeply need is a parent who can be there to be what I call that anchor point Mm. that just says hey I'm here and this is not too big for me and I can sit with you in the uncomfortable and that's really hard as a parent because every part of us wants to fix Mm. and so I often say to parents you know this will happen when your teen's going through something hard there's going to be a part of you that's like this is not okay And you're going to want to jump in and fix it. And the kindest thing you can do in that moment is go and call a friend or talk to your partner and say, God, this is so painful watching my kid go through this, but, and it's bringing up all my own feelings around it. And I just need to talk it out first. So then I can come back and be that calm anchor for my child. So, you know, so much of, I think, raising kids is being, is tuning into, you know, our own stories and how we are reacting when something goes on. So coming back to that listening piece, you know, those beautiful teens kept saying to me, we want to be heard without being judged. We want to be heard without being fixed. And we want to be heard without the parent jumping into the drama with them. And again, that kind of ties back into our own stories. Mm. You know, if you grew up and had experiences where people didn't play with you or perhaps you were bullied or you didn't, you know, you didn't feel like you were very clever at maths or whatever is our story, we've all got it. And then our child starts playing out the same story stuff, it is going to hit that sweet spot within us. And we are going to get into our own wounds and story around it. And that is not what our kids need. They don't need to be carrying our baggage. You know, they are constantly saying to us, that's yours. I don't want to carry that forward. And so when we learn to listen well, and we can actually sit back and see our beautiful kids and go, my job here is not, is not to fix. It is just to be present. Mm. It is to listen. It is to offer empathy and compassion. And then when a child feels heard, when they've had the opportunity to cry or rage or vent or talk about how unfair it is, then it opens up possibility for them to learn or grow or create the change that they need to create. Mm. 